Matthew chapter 13 serves as the focus for our message this morning if you want to open up God's word this morning to that. Now, uh, as we focus in on the parable of the weeds this morning, I know that this may come as a bit of a shock to you, but in no way does this parable that we're talking about today have any connection to the boom of business that is widely sleeping across the states of Colorado and Washington State. The parable of the weeds is about a different kind of weed, okay? And it's a different weed that grows within the harvest. It grows within the wheat fields. Some of you are delaying that reaction a little bit. Uh, well, you're very excited. <laughs> there are eight of these judgment parables within the gospel, this gospel of Matthew this morning, and we'll talk about one of them here today. And it's a very serious judgment parable that speaks of those who are sons and daughters of God's eternal kingdom, but it also speaks to those who, who cause sin, who do evil, and who ultimately will live forever under the wrath of God in eternal torment. So friends in Christ, if you've ever attempted to, at the very least, take care of a garden, you probably know how difficult it can be. And no doubt that the soil and the life, that it needs some some serious, tender, loving care by its gardener. And when the season of winter finally changes to spring, the first green that comes up in any lawn every season is the weeds. It's always the weeds. They, they can thrive in a variety of temperatures and a variety of climates. They quickly can take over a well-manicured lawn. They can suck up all the nutrients of that soil and choke out that which is good. And we all know that eradicating weeds is an endless task. It's a constant fight, a vigorous and a steady one. Well, last week we spent time focusing in, in the scriptures on the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 which spoke specifically about the seed being broadcast and spread out and it being received in many different ways. Three ways that weren't very fruitful, but yet the good and the most fertile of soils receiving that seed and an abundant harvest coming forth, 30, 60, 100 fold. Well, before we dive into looking at this parable, I think it's important that we set a proper framework for both of what these two parables mean, the parable of the sower and the parable of the weeds. The intended meaning that Jesus, I believe, has for us in our consideration today speaks to how the barometer of one's faith is not only what we say, but also what we we do. Jesus is is calling faith to action here in these parables. This is what Jesus is making. He's, He's making a fruitful harvest through the spreading of his seed, the spreading of his word, and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Yet we know that our faith is indeed a gift from God. We know that we ourselves can't live a life of good works and a life of obedience to receive that which Christ so freely gives to us. We receive that on the merits of Christ Jesus alone, who dies, who rises, and who promises in this parable that he comes again on a great day of judgment. So now Jesus repeatedly taught his disciples in these parables, these stories that have an earthly meaning to speak spiritual truth into your life and into my life. And everyone back in that day when Jesus was talking knew that a farmer, in order to produce a great harvest, needed to have good, productive seed. But then Jesus in this parable speaks of how an enemy sneaks in and sows bad seed within that field and then slips away unnoticed. Clearly, Jesus is speaking about Satan, about the devil, about the great deceiver himself. Yet the key to this parable lies not only with the enemy, but it also lies with the weeds. The particular weed that Jesus is speaking about here is called darnel, and and what this weed looked a lot like when it was young was was wheat. It was very hard to distinguish between these two. And so Jesus is speaking in this parable about how there's the good wheat and there are the toxic weeds that grow up side by side, and they look very similar. Well, one day you you read there in the scriptures that that Jesus' disciples, the servants approach the master. They come and they say, didn't you sow good seed in the field? Well, where did all these weeds come from? The servants who have been working out in the field, they they know the difference between these weeds and weeds, even though it's pretty hard to notice. The master acknowledges that the evil one has has sown and has used that power to, to, to have an effect on the fruitfulness of the harvest. But he instructs his servants to do something. He instructs them not to go out and pull up the weeds that the wheat may not be pulled up at the same time. Rather, he, he, he says, allow them both to grow until the time of harvest comes, at which time then they will be separated from one another. Jesus is forecasting this coming day of judgment when evil will be done away with and all good 
The, 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 the harmonious perfection that once existed before sin entered into this world will once again be renewed. So my friends, the parable of the weed, what I love, the weeds, what I love most about this parable is that Jesus doesn't just t- take the time to, to speak a parable, but he, he speaks the truth. He speaks the meaning of the parable to his disciples when they ask him later. And I'm, I'm a big fan of the times when Jesus does this because it gives us a clear sense and clear purpose and clear direction and clear wisdom of what Jesus is explaining, how, is he, how he's explaining the kingdom of heaven in parables in such blunt and vivid ways for us. So the disciples, they ask Jesus for this meaning of the parable. Jesus speaks that meaning. He says, I am the son of man who is always at work sowing good seed. And sometimes that seed takes good effect. And other times that seed is mitigated. It's rejected. And the field that Jesus talks about here, well, some widely misunderstand that to be the church. But in this parable, Jesus is clear this speaks to the world. This speaks to the entire world through this parable. No way is this meant just for the followers of Christ. And the children of this kingdom, well, they are the ones who are following Jesus uh, with great eagerness and obedience. The the, the, the children of God who who aren't living as the world would have them to live. Their their worldview, their their spiritual habits, they they are on uh, bringing glory to God. But God also speaks about the weeds. He speaks about those who reject the saving love and knowledge of Christ Jesus. He speaks about those who turn around in private uh, lives when they put their faith on display in front of others but are quick to turn around and inwardly hide that in or, or openly live lives of sin and unrepentance. Jesus speaks about this great harvest in this parable that is coming. And this harvest represents the end of the age. And make no mistake about it, this is the last and the final judgment that Jesus forecasts and speaks about in this parable. At the harvest time, when all will be collected up. And who is it that the parable says will will do the collecting? Well, it's Jesus accompanied by his angels, accompanied by his heavenly host. We are not to make the judgment on a brother or sister in Christ or a brother and sister in our community who may not know Christ. But God is the final judge. He makes that judgment. And Matthew also speaks about what happens to those who sow evil. It speaks about a place of weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Matthew uses this phrase six times in his gospel to descriptively uh, give you a sense of, of what hell is like. But then Jesus ends the parable. He ends the parable with all of the redeemed children of God who believe, who, who call upon his name, that they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And what awaits them is their glorious and eternal inheritance. As you can see, I wasn't kidding earlier when I spoke about how concerning of a judgment parable this is. And can you believe how many people in this world still believe today that there really is no existence of hell? That there's really no hell? Don't be so easily fooled, for for God in his word not only speaks about the presence of hell, but gives details to hell in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and concerning this place of eternal torment. Yet... And with God, we can thanks thanks be to God, there's always a yet. The Bible is clear and certain about this. God is gracious. He is slow to anger. And he does abound in steadfast love. And we'll further that point here in a minute. But while this parable may give you a sense of God's vengeance and God's wrath, it is also clear that God is gracious, he is slow to anger, and he does abound in steadfast love. And God commissions you Just as the youth have been commissioned to embark on the the San Diego journey this next week, God is commissioning us to go out with him. Not not, not for him, but he goes with us. We join Jesus on his mission to bring the hope and to bring the love of Christ to our community, to our state, to our nation, and throughout the world. So we've talked about the meaning of the parable. Let's draw some application from this parable this morning, and then I'll end my message with what I hope is a meaningful illustration. So how does this parable of timeless truth have relevance for you and I in our lives today? Well, we all know that the devil's at, at work against God, that he's going about and sowing that, that bad seed that will ultimately affect the fruitfulness of the harvest. But God trumps the devil every single time. And I want to make two points today in regards to this parable. The first point that I want to make in regards to this parable is I want you to see that the master is not, he's not caught off guard by what the enemy has done. He's not going about and acting in a rash or a, or a brazen manner. He, he, he actually says, no, let them grow together, and at the time of the harvest, then everything will be uprooted at the same time. He doesn't want the, the young wheat being uprooted when the weeds are also being pulled out of the ground. 
And so as I mentioned, here is your evidence for God who is, who is slow to anger, who is gracious and who does abound in steadfast love. He's merciful toward his creation. We know from the scriptures Jesus doesn't come for the healthy, but he comes for the sick. He comes for all people who are sick. He comes to seek and to save the lost. He comes to, to be there with the down and out. He comes to be with the demon possessed, the adulterers, the self-righteous Pharisees, because he wants everyone to know that the grace of God is for them. It's just as much for them as the person to the left, the person to the right. He loves all of us the same. And Jesus knows that the truth of the gospel lies in the transformation of taking a hard-hearted sinner and making them new in Christ Jesus to be a glorious, redeemed saint. And here's also another thing. Jesus knows that over time, even some of those weeds can become grain. Even some of the weeds can become grain. I hope you know what I'm talking about here. Even some of those who reject Christ may come to a knowledge of Christ, may come through the work of the Holy Spirit to a salvation that is in Jesus. And this transformation, it happens around us all of the time. And if we are just even a bit more intentional about it in our lives of faith, in our lives of missional community and spiritual growth, then we could see this happening more often. The scriptures say God is patient with you. He, not, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. So God, the master in this parable, shows great patience and, and resilience in letting these two coexist together until the harvest comes. Jesus says also in the same field that the enemy is working so diligently in sowing that evil as he, the sower, is planting that good seed. And while on this earth, while believers are to be yoked with unbelievers, they're, they're to live amongst each other, but not to, be, uh, not, not to be yoked in the way that we live like those who are, who are in unbelief. But we still live together. We share this world together. And God commissions you to once again go with him to spread the gospel news of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, a second application that we can draw from this parable today is the, is the fate that's described here of those who follow Christ and walk in his ways and, and in his obedience and also those who sow evil, do, who do evil and who are, who are connected and under the judgment of the, of the devil, under the power of the devil. For this parable clearly describes a picture of this final judgment that's coming. And it's pretty hard to believe that hell doesn't exist after you hear and read this parable and the other seven judgment parables throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Those lawbreakers who are controlled by the devil uh, suffer eternally in the fiery furnace, as Jesus says in this parable, while those who are found to be righteous will receive that glorious inheritance that awaits them. We all know that the fruitfulness of one's life is the measure by which the Holy Spirit is working in the life of that believer. We know that it is God who does this. We know that it is not ourselves, but this is the barometer of one's faith. This is the work of the Spirit. How are you being fruitful in your life? How is God making fruit in your life this morning? So today I want to close with a, a simple illustration that I hope will bring some meaning and some purpose to this parable. And when you have a garden or when you have something, that, 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 a field that, that can produce a fruitful harvest, well, how do you go about choking out the weeds in that garden? How do you go about taking that which exists in that garden and doing it harm and then re-emerging re and, and helping care for that garden? One of the ways that you can do that is you can weed it hand by hand. Get down on your hands and knees and take each one of those roots all the way out. But I'm telling you, you better get to the base of the root or in a week or two, those weeds will be right back, re-emerging at the surface of that garden. Or what you can do is you can do what I do. You can take this battle-tested solution to your garden which is Roundup. Now, we all know how Roundup, how strong Roundup is. This solution, when I apply this to the weeds, it doesn't just kill the weeds. It will kill anything that touches it around it. So if I have grass in my garden, it will kill the grass. If I go spray this on my grass to the weeds that are all over the lawn, you'll see little patches of nothing throughout my entire lawn. This is some strong stuff. This stuff kills everything it touches, seeds, plants, grass, and the like. And it doesn't take long for it to accomplish the task. When I spray this, less than two hours later, I can go out and they're all yellow and stained. So it is with God's law. So it is with God's law that it doesn't take long for God's law to, to kill us. For us to have that task accomplished for us, the scriptures say God has made us competent as ministers of the law 
of a new covenant, not of the law, but of the Spirit, for the law kills, but the Spirit brings to life. The law of God condemns each and every one of us. None of us in God's house of worship can, can say that we are above God's law. So that law is like the solution of Roundup that oozes into our lives and, and it really reveals to us the shriveled nature of what we are. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God because in Christ Jesus, your risen Lord and Savior, Jesus comes in this parable today and speaks about an entirely different concept of Roundup. He speaks about a Roundup that is coming, but a Roundup in which all people will come face to face before their Creator on this great day of judgment and when the gospel will reach its full, final, and complete fulfillment all believers rounded up to experience the glorious riches of his presence for all of eternity. This is a day that will not only bring new life, but it brings eternal life for all who believe. And the evil foe, well, it will no longer have any power. The law of God will no longer have any power over us because God's gospel in Christ Jesus will be there and that seed that has been taking root and is ready for harvest will then at that time be harvested. So friends in Christ, my final question for you today, there is a great roundup that is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let us bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Good and gracious Lord, we thank you this day for the blessings of the promise and truth of your word. Boy, for such serious judgment parables, Lord, we can see a picture of your vengeance and your divine wrath. But Lord, also through these parables, you open to us the truth of your gospel that we may see a picture of your amazing grace and mercy that you bestow upon us and the commissioning that you give to us to go with you, to go with the power of Jesus, to go with the power of the Holy Spirit and to call people to a life of repentance and faith in Jesus. Lord, we are so honored to have that privilege in our life that you would entrust to us this ministry of reconciliation. And may we lean on the one who has no sin, who became sin for us, that through him we might receive the everlasting righteousness of God and the eternal blessings that come to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is in his most glorious and precious and holy name that we pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen. amen.